It doesn't have to be through victims and oppressors and we're perpetually in these roles and we have to show solidarity because that's what some, you know, sociologist is telling us, you know, um, who we're uplifting and centering now. It doesn't have to be that way. There's better ways to do this work and there are scholars who are talking about it. There are people developing curricula around it. Um, and it, and it's time for us to take a look at that and get back to the values uh, that, that we hold dear. Otherwise, we're just gonna be torn asunder by these divisive uh, ideologies. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Glenn Show. I'm Glenn Lowry. I'm with Tabia Lee, uh, who is a former uh, Director of Diversity, Equity, and, and Inclusion at De Anza Community College in Cupertino, California, uh, and uh, has a kindly agreed to join us here uh, to talk about the links between the diversity, equity, and inclusion critical social justice uh, movement and the problem of anti-Semitism on American college campuses that has been much discussed of late in the aftermath of the uh, attack in southern Israel on October 7th and the war that has ensued uh, as a result of that. We're not necessarily here to talk about the uh, Middle East or anything like that, but uh, thank you very much, Tabia, for uh, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Glenn. You're welcome. I should mention the Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute in New York City, Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, where I am uh, a John Paulson uh, Senior Fellow, and I'm also a professor of economics uh, and uh, professor of the social sciences here at Brown University. So this is the Glenn Show. So... <laughs> I was just saying, as we uh, were talking before we began recording, that uh, as much as I talk about the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you are the first person I've ever had on the show uh, who's actually working as a has worked as a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. I'm 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 curious how you came to that line of work and what what is it that you guys do? Yeah, so I'm a lifelong educator, Glenn, and um, I've been teaching, I often say, since I was, you know, going to school myself uh, as a gifted and talented education student who was often used as a peer tutor. Uh, but of course, I got my formal education and um, became a teacher in uh, East uh, Los Angeles Public Middle Schools. And uh, during that time that I was teaching gifted English language learners, I was also serving as a teacher trainer and professional development designer. Um, helping teachers to understand giftedness as a, as a translingual learning need. Um, and this was during in California during the time of English only instruction. It was like legislated uh, for that. So they had pushed all of the languages out of the school and schools. And, you know, um, some teachers had perceptions that if you weren't English language proficient, you couldn't possibly be gifted. So I was helping teachers understand diversity of thinking and minds even at that time. Um, and then, you know, as I just went on, I was always looking at, you know, how can we have more inclusive learning environments and uh, looking to build that in my classroom. So um, I designed a civic education program uh, for the students and teachers um, and, you know, taught English and social studies. And uh, it's just always been something that I've that I've been passionate about, just better teaching, teaching as a craft. Um, after I got my doctorate in educational leadership and administration, I traveled for a little bit outside the U.S. and um, went to many places I had wanted to go, you know, um, as I was teaching ancient sites, Egypt and so forth. This is pre-revolution. Um, and then when I came back, the jobs weren't beaten down the door like I thought they would after I got my doctorate. So I did an adjunct teaching for some time. Um, often in uh, private Catholic universities uh, who were committed to social justice. And it, uh, even during that time, you know, serving as a teacher educator, um, working with master's teachers programs and, and helping teachers to improve their craft. How do you design curriculum and instruction? Um, and finally, during the pandemic, that's when I had that break into the uh, community college space. And that was the first time um, that I had a tenure track position. Uh, but it was a temporary for my first one, serving as an instructional designer. You know, everyone was panicking to get their classes online at that time. Um, and then after that, I uh, found myself at De Anza College after a very rigorous search um, in the position that you mentioned previously, which was a, a faculty director 
Foreign Office of Equity, Social Justice, and Multicultural Education. So you were a member of the faculty at uh, De Anza. Yes, yes. Always as a faculty member, as a co-learner, um, co-teacher. That, that's always been my role. Um, you know, even though I had that, you know, background with a doctorate in educational leadership, it was for teacher leadership. I'm always focused on what's going on in the trenches. <laughs> and because of your interest in language and giftedness, you had uh, your finger in the diversity uh, arena just mm-hmm. very quite naturally in the kind of work that you were doing. Yes, yes. So, okay, you have a story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. We're at the beginning. What happened next? So, um, you know, I was hired on at Dan's as a, as a faculty director. And um, even during the interview process, you know, I was uh, warned that there were some difficulties and challenges that they were looking to fix and address. And, You know, of course, I looked to assure them that I was the right person for the job. Um, So they talked about, for example, the office being a little too woke in its approach. Um, And whenever people use language and words, you know, terms like that that are highly charged, I always like to know what do they mean. And so I asked them, you know, what do you what do you mean by that? Give me some examples. And they said, uh, you know, the faculty, when they go to the office that you would potentially be working for, they feel uncomfortable. Um, They feel like they're being accused of being a racist or called transphobic, you know, or called, it's told that they're not very good teachers. And I said, well, by that definition, you know, I'm I'm not woke, uh, but but I can work with woke people, you know, and I have worked with people who are who are woke um, and brought them together to talk to others who are different from different perspectives. Um, And so uh, I had the green light once I passed through, you know, the multiple stages of interviewing and teaching demonstrations. Um, I, I thought I would be in an environment where I would be supported to do my work. But as, as soon as I started to do it, like literally within the first couple of weeks, um, there were signs that, you know, there was some deeply entrenched, um, issues there at the campus around anti-Semitism, around authentic inclusion, um, around, uh, let, um, let, let me, mm-hmm. excuse me for interrupting, but I want to just clarify, there's a staff to this office that's independent of the faculty. You're the yeah. faculty member who's the director. There are other faculty members who interact with the office, but the office constituency, the office staff is independent of the faculty. Yes, they're actually um, c- classified staff members. So they're not, they're not um, teachers. They would be um, just uh, staff members, classified, not certificated, uh, meaning that they're, not okay. un- they're under like a, um, a workers union, not a faculty union. And they have a reputation among the faculty for being, quote unquote, woke. Yeah. And you're, yes. you're warned of this as you're coming in as a faculty member with responsibilities to direct this office, that the people you're going to be working with there have a particular outlook. But yeah. you feel that you can handle that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, as an educator, you're, you, I'm accustomed to, you know, working with people from different perspectives. Um, that's part of my work as someone who's in the diversity and inclusion field. You know, how do we bring together diverse perspectives and, and help people identify common goals so that they can best serve their students and communities? And that was something that, you know, I had I'd worked on many, many years uh, becoming a trained dialogue facilitator and you know, how do people navigate courageous or sticky conversations? How do we deal with complexity? You know, those are all things that um, I have a lot of background in, in, in doing and in guiding educators through. Um, so to me, that that just seemed to be, you know, the basic field of education. You're always going to have these diverse perspectives and different opinions and viewpoints, but people still have to be able to work together to serve their students. So how would you characterize the outlook of the staff that you inherited when you became faculty director of diversity, equity, and inclusion office at uh, De Anza? Well, there were some things that were pointed out to me, you know, right away um, as I started, you know, because I started off by doing needs assessment conversations. I, I never like to assume that I just know something about a situation. I like to get in and speak to people on the ground. Uh, so I did over 60 hours of needs assessment conversations. And some of the first ones that I did were with the staff members. I wanted to see, you know, what were the challenges they saw? How did they see the campus? Um, And in one of the first ones, um, so it's a small office, two staff members, myself and a supervising dean of equity and engagement. 
Um, and one of the people who I first interviewed told me that they were a finalist for the position that I was in. Um, and they told me that they were a former student at uh, De Anza College, and they just didn't understand why I, as an outsider, was selected. Uh, they had heard nothing about me. Um, they didn't know how, what my commitment was to equity. And, uh, and they basically told me at the end of the conversation that I would have a rough ride ahead of me. Um, and they felt entitled to my position. Um, and so that was a, an interesting thing to kind of walk into and to have that interpersonal component uh, initially. Um, but that quickly turned from just a one-to-one -one thing to a larger group uh, dynamic uh, during one of our first team meetings, which was shortly after that, you know, initial needs assessment conversation. And that same person um, accused me of um, white speaking, white explaining, and supporting white supremacy during a team meeting. And Glenn, I had never it's, encountered anything. Who was in this meeting? Excuse me again. I just want clarification. Who was in this meeting? So this will be a team meeting uh, with the two individuals I had mentioned and uh, the Women, Gender, and uh, Sexuality Coordinating uh, Office also attended that meeting. So three, three folks in the meeting and myself. White splaining, white supremacy. And How white so? speaking. And um, I didn't know what they meant until many weeks later when I saw a slide that they were using uh, where it, it was called white supremacy culture characteristics. But during the context of the meeting, what was so jarring to me is, you know, I was um, explaining a Google document. Um, so I had been in, you know, a couple team meetings. They were very casually oriented. And of course, my job and my role there was to lead a strategic transformation. So I couldn't just keep chatting with people every week, right? We had to get some structure into the meetings. Um, and so I suggested us using a Google Doc. I said, you know, I've made this so we can all edit it. Um, perhaps we can put in events that are coming up since I'm so new, I don't know the flow of the year and so forth. Uh, maybe you could tell me how you'd like for me to support various initiatives you're working on. And we can track what we're doing in our meetings and how we're spending our time and what our agendas are and, and begin to develop those. And that's when I was told to stop what I was doing and, and that what I was doing was white speaking and, and white explaining by the individual who had previously told me I'd have a rough road. And I was so shocked um, to hear those words used against me as a black woman, a racialized black woman. You know, um, I had never in my teaching career heard other teachers talk to each other in such a way or say such words to each other. Um, and I asked the person, I said, you know, I, I haven't come in here calling anyone names or saying anything mean or rude to anyone. And I said, what you just said to me, it feels very hurtful and rude. And I explained to them, you know, where I come from and what I understood white supremacy to be. So I'm from the Central Valley, California, um, small town called Lodi. I had actually encountered um, white nationalists and white supremacists in my daily life. And so to have someone call me that, a white supremacist, and saying I'm supporting white supremacy or white speaking and white explaining, um, I said, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like that kind of um, inter engagement with each other. Let's not call each other names. Um, let's just keep things professional. And when I said that, I was viewed as uh, offensive to, to the other individuals on the call. And, and why I say that is because all their faces changed as though I was now injuring the person who had said those terrible words to me just by saying, please don't say those things. Um, and from that moment onward, you know, things uh, just in terms of dynamics, worldview, uh, I started to notice, you know, uh, other small and large things that, that cued me into the fact that, you know, when we were using these words, equity, diversity, inclusion, we were all meaning something different. And, and, and also my needs assessment conversations, folks had told me, you know, like we have this long history of activism and social justice, but we're all meaning different things. And that's why we're kind of flatlining right now. We're not, we're, we're on different pages. We're not all on the same page. So, uh, so that's Did you say, excuse me again, did you say that there was a dean who had oversight responsibilities in this area? I'm just wondering where he or she weighed in uh, in this process that you're describing. Yes, there was a supervising dean. Um, and after this initial, this event happened where I was called a white supremacist and white speaking and white explaining, I went to the dean. Um, because Glenn, normally, if there's a difficulty in communication on a team, I would be the person who would facilitate that, you know, discussion, conversation, unpacking, if you will. 
Uh, but because I was the person being attacked, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I went to the supervising dean and I said, you know, this is what happened. This person called me a, a white supremacist and said I was white speaking and white explaining. And I told her the same things, you know, where I'm from and what that means. And, and I said, you know, we need to get someone in, not me, because I'm not properly positioned to talk about intercultural and interteam communication. And how do we do that in a professional way? without name calling, without, you know, uh, resorting to um, calling people um, offensive, you know, terms. And um, I asked her, you know, could she please arrange to get someone to come in to do that because there was an urgent need for that. And she said, oh, you know, I, I really don't think so. You know, um, I don't think it was really meant that way. Um, she said, I'll ask the person to apologize to you. Um, and I said, okay, well, if you're not willing to bring someone in, then I'm going to ask that you yourself come to the team meetings just to maintain civility and, you know, a civil discourse, because uh, for me, I'm not comfortable <laughs> talking to folks, you know, who have uh, called me a white supremacist and in, in, in other harmful and derogatory terms. And so I said, we need someone, you know, with a supervising capacity, because I, I had no supervising capacity, we're, you know, equals, um, to come in and just maintain an, 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 an environment of civil discourse. And um, the the dean started to come to the meetings, uh, Glenn, but they didn't maintain an environment of civil discourse. They actually became the ringleader of a harassing and bullying environment. Um, and, and everyone else referred to, deferred to that person. Um, and, and so it was like a gang up each week. Uh, it became fairly quickly um, of, of, you know, my supervising dean in agreement with these individuals. The person never apologized to me. In fact, they stopped communicating with me completely. And it was uh, as though I was a non-person, um, you know, almost immediately. And, and others were encouraged to do the same. It just, it just unraveled due to, due to the lack of leadership at the senior leadership level as well. Uh, I saw your piece in the New York Post. Uh, that was published a couple of weeks after uh, the October 7th attack by Hamas on the uh, kibbutzim in southern Israel, mm -hmm. the rave festival and all of that. And you, in that piece, uh, editorial said you thought you understood some of the source for anti-Semitic and, and, and uh, anti-Israel uh, uh, sentiment that uh, Jewish students and others were complaining about as coming up on various campuses throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to give you the opportunity to explain what you see as the source of that and how it connects to your experience that you've just been describing in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion management at uh, De Anza. Yes. So, um, you know, when I was asked about um, you know, post October 7th, you know, campus environments. And was I surprised at it? I said, I was absolutely not surprised, Lynn. Uh, because the things that I had seen very up close, you know, from uh, 2021 all the way through 2023 at De Anza College and other California community colleges had shown me the environment um, that is being produced and guided by senior leadership members as well as faculty members. Uh, on campuses. And what I mean by that is uh, we had um, community members come in right when I first started. They went to the Equity Action Council, which is supposed to make the campus a more equitable campus as well. Again, this is all taxpayer funded, um, you know, taxpayer dollars uh, at work. Um, and community members said, you know, the environment here is hostile towards Jewish faculty, staff, and students. They gave multiple examples, um, and they gave us some recommendations and some asks that would make them as a community feel um, more welcome, more included, and more like they belonged on campus. It was things, Glenn, like... Um, please don't start the academic calendar on um, Rosh Hashanah or, you know, uh, other high holy holidays of the Jewish faith. It, it had been happening, they told us, for decades. And there had been many complaints made, no changes made. Um, they also mentioned um, for the students, we have a website uh, page that says, Scanning Against Racism. And um, they had some, you know, Black Lives Matter Global Foundation flags up there and Stop AAPI Hate, you know, um, 
um, statements and slogans up there. And they said, would you please just add a little section there that says, you know, we stand against anti-Semitism as well. And they cited the rise in uh, campus uh, anti-Semitism. And, you know, just uh, we can even give you cut and paste, you know, that you could put up there saying we stand against it. When we took this back to my team uh, to talk about it, because it wasn't discussed in the Equity Action Council and we had these written recommendations, I said, you know, I'd like to get to work on on these things. Um, Not only did this person come to the Equity Action Council, but I shared with the team that I had had these needs assessment conversations where faculty members and even senior leadership had mentioned to me these problems with anti-Semitism. And I said, so what are we going to do? And the supervising dean said, we're going to do nothing about it. And I said, we're going to do nothing. She said, we also have recommendations from CARE, which is the Council on Islamic Relations. And we've done nothing about those either. And I said, well, could I see those? I mean, my job is to increase inclusion. I'd like to see if any community member or group is asking us to make change. And I was never shown those recommendations from CARE. And when I said, um, you know, I, why are we not going to work on, you know, um, anti-Semitism? It's a clear issue. There's not even a definition of it on our campus. It's something we need to work around. I was told that Jews are white oppressors. And um, as such... Told our, by whom? I'm sorry. Told by, by the whom? supervising dean. The supervising dean. Um, and that our role and our focus in our department is decentering whiteness. And that's what we needed to be focused on. And uh, I had never heard of such terms. That was not in the job description. Um, that was not in any institutional document. This is in our conversation as a team of why we're not going to do this. And later, as I you know, began to understand their ideology that they were working from, that became my, you know, I wanted to know who am I surrounded by? What, what are they meaning? What are they saying? Um, that's when I, you know, started to unpack and look at what they were talking about when they were mentioning white supremacy culture, they meaning my dean and my staff members. Um, you know, I saw one of their slides and it had these poison bottles on it. And it, it had things like being on time, being objective, and they kept putting it up in their meetings that they would host or with guests that they would invite to campus. Um, and, you know, we're here in Zoom. Uh, this is all digital uh, during the pandemic time. Um, and so one day it had a citation and I went and looked up who, who is that? And I found Tim O'Conn's work, O'Conn and Jones. Um, and then I started to, to better understand what they were meaning when they were saying white supremacists and calling me that and accusing me of that because I was attempting to set an agenda um, in the meeting uh, that was considered to be offensive to their worldview. And, but Glenn, I felt offended because it was as though they were telling me they had an expectation of me um, as a, they use this term BIPOC, it's Black Indigenous Person of Color. Um, they set this the world up in a binary between BIPOC and white people. And so their expectation of BIPOC people is that we're not on time. We don't set agendas. We don't look at the written word. Um, we should be doing everything actively against that. And, and to me, that's setting yourself and your students and your community up for failure. All the things I had taught my students to value, you know, how do you become young scholars? How do you contribute to your community and be involved civically? It involved the things, the, the characteristics that they're calling and labeling white supremacy culture and giving to, you know, um, white supremacy culture. And, and I find that deeply offensive uh, because, you know, that means they have low expectations of me. I'm supposed to be the opposite of that, the embodiment, you know, the opposite of that in this equity, you know, faculty director role. Um, and just realizing their low expectations of me, um, and, and, and their assumptions about me, you know, just based purely on how I look from the outside. Um, I found that to be very hypocritical of everything that they talk about, you know, when they say they want people to be their authentic selves and their whole selves. Um, that's not what was happening there. And then the, the answer I was given on why, the dean and the and the supporting staff would not support any work around anti-Semitism. That that was also offensive to me as an educator because to me that was something that was a basic. Like if you have a group that says we feel like we're being pushed out and it's hostile for us, and your role and you're being paid, you know, with the community funds to make this a more inclusive environment, 
Um, and to say, have people say, no, we're not going to do that. They're white oppressors. And, the, and then when I pointed out, you know, the Jewish diaspora is very diverse. It's, it's rich. It's broad. Um, how can you classify, you know, that group? Show me where you're even getting that from. I said, I've never even heard terms like this. And they would never produce the evidence for me or show me where they're getting, you know, um, this classification from even. Um, it was always just, you know, this is the truth. And if you don't agree, um, you know, you're not welcome here. You're you're not doing what we wanted you to do here. And um, and so I had to literally just go to community members and um, to the faculty members who had pointed out to me the problems. And I had to, to work without a budget and bring in speakers and, um, you know, try to do some education around it uh, for the community, because that was that was what I was there to do. Okay, so the answer I'm taking from you to my question of how do we get to anti-Semitism is that the world is divided into uh, oppressors and victims. The oppressors are white, the victims are BIPOC. Mm -hmm. Jews are white, ergo, Jews are oppressors. Palestinians, I guess by extension of this kind of logic, are people of color, are incorporated somehow into the BIPOC coalition. And so uh, they, they are the victims. And that's their account of this conflict that uh, has ensued over the last 75 years since the founding of the State of Israel. And I, I guess I want to I wanna say about that, that that is a gross oversimplification that actually betrays the responsibility to educate here regardless of, quote unquote, whose side you're on, I mean, that we can get to that. We can get to figuring out what we want to say and what we want to do about the conflict and what's wrong and what's right. But let's just understand the circumstance. And that, that flattens and is ahistorical and ignorant, it, it would appear to me, and should be objected to strongly, should not be tolerated in an institution of higher education. Pardon me for the little speech there, but that's, that's kind of what I see. Yes. And, and unfortunately, Glenn, it's being it's not only being tolerated, it's being held up as the only way um, to understand, you know, these geopolitical and world issues um, in many institutions. And if you even suggest that, you know, there's other ways to view this, um, you know, the, we don't have to view everything through a matrix of domination and oppression. Uh, even just saying that got me labeled as a pariah. Um, and, you know, people saying that I was trying to destroy intersectionality. Um, you know, and all these other kind of accusations that, you know, because of the people I cited, which included your colleague, John McWhorter, um, that I was leading people to danger, even with my citations, um, and that I should watch who I cite and be careful about it. Uh, this is the environment that, that people are working in, and, and often you don't hear about it because, you know, what happens for us as faculty members, um, we're advised, by, at least I was, by many mentors, you know, Lee, just resign it'll be like this never happened and you go to another place. I, I could have taken that option. I could have done that. Um, but then I felt like there were people who were being very unprofessional bullies and gangsters in an, a learning environment. And I felt like they had done this before and they would just keep doing it. So if I just disappear quietly and save myself, right, then I'm contributing to the problem as well. So that's why I chose uh, to go public. I knew the risks. I knew that I would probably never get a t another tenure track position. Um, I was told that directly by some of my mentors. Um, and I said, you know, at this point in time, the risk is too great. We're being told, to watch who you cite. Um, you know, you're not going to get in the way of our uh, progress we've made. You know, just the statements that were made on a one-to-one -one level and the, and the bullying and intimidation that took place. Um, and, and then once I went public, hearing from people across the nation that it wasn't just California or something weird, you know. Sometimes people say, California, you guys are a little weird over there. That's just the California thing. Right. This is happening all over the place, Glenn. And well, I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you, Tabia, because uh, with respect, uh, De Anza Community College in Cupertino, California is hardly, you know, where I'm going to look to see what's representative yeah. of American higher education. So uh, what, what gives you good reason to think that the phenomenon you experienced there, as unhappy as it was, is is characteristic of DEI offices in other places, bigger, you know, big state colleges or elite private universities and so on. Yes. And to that, I would say, um, you know, it, it, it's been an eye opener for all of us, the news, turning on our news on a weekly basis and seeing 
some people are calling them uh, protests. I'm calling them pro-Hamas rallies. Um, seeing the statements that are being made, some of the same statements that I had uh, put in my complaints, you know, in my little microcosmic uh, interaction at De Anza, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It's been a long-standing statement before October 7th, but to many American ears, they had never heard that. Um, until, you know, recent times when you turn on your news and you see children and students being locked up in libraries, um, teachers um, in, in the K through 12 sector uh, who went to a pro-Israel rally whose students are demanding them being fired and locking them in their offices. I mean, we've seen some really terrible things these past few weeks. And what we've seen, though, Glenn, is the fruits of labor of this toxic ideology writ large. We're seeing what is happening in our K through 12 schools as well as in our colleges and universities. And it's not just California, it's New York, it's a small town, it's a large town. We're seeing it throughout the nation. It's in Washington, DC. Um, we're seeing people and students, things I never thought I would see on a large scale, um, celebrating terrorists and terrorism um, and saying that, you know, this is, the actions are justified due to systemic racism and oppression. We're hearing the terms that a lot of people, unless you were in a niche field like me in DEI, or if you were an ethnic studies teacher or a gender studies teacher, you might have known that those terms before. Now they're mainstreamed. Uh, they're on our news. They're in our newspapers. Uh, when you go on social media, they're on the social media. And so we're seeing what is being taught manifested in the streets of America. Um, and we're seeing a call for and a support for actual terrorist groups uh, that are identified at the federal level as, fed as, as terrorist groups. Uh, okay, I, I have to um, try to conjure the, the other side here, terrorists. One person's terrorist, another person's freedom fighter is the way the cliche goes. Uh, you have to view these struggles in historical context. Uh, and as far as DEI and anti-Semitism is concerned, no, we're not anti-Semites. Uh, we are social justice warriors. We, we identify with people who are struggling for their freedom. From the river to the sea doesn't mean we want to expel all the Jews. It means that we want political representation on a one-person, one-vote equal basis for everybody who lives between the river and the sea. Uh, the reason that people of color, BIPOCs, are rallying to the side, not of terrorists, we keep calling them terrorists. The reason we're rallying to the side of the people in Gaza who are bound in, boy, uh, blockaded and subjugated is because we have a sense of solidarity with these kinds of struggles. We've been here before. We've seen the aftermath of European colonialism at the southern tip of the African continent, uh, in the uh, Indian subcontinent where the British uh, uh, ruled for uh, so long. Uh, subjugating people in the East. Uh, and and uh, we remember the uh, fight for Algeria uh, against the French colonialists and so on. And uh, as people of color who have struggled against the aftermath of slavery and the new world and everything, uh, we feel solidarity with those struggles. Uh, you call us anti-Semites. And, and in fact, you betray your responsibility uh, to advocate for social justice when you do that. We see further and more deeply then you do know uh, the Jewish people are not racially monolithic, but Israel is indeed a product of the West. It's in its historical origins and in its current, uh, uh, they got nuclear weapons over there for crying out loud. How do you think they got them? Where do you think those scientists were educated? Uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so your, your vision, I, we're sorry for your, un I, I continue here with my devil's advocate. We're sorry <laughs> for your un pleasant experience when you encountered some perhaps not entirely well enlightened advocates of our philosophy, but our philosophy is sound. We're fighting for justice on a global scale and we identify with the struggle of the Palestinian people. Yes. And that, and that, and what you just mentioned, those are heart um, felt beliefs and, and, and attitudes and perspectives. Um, the problem is when you're on an American college campus and you say, that's the only perspective you may have here. Um, and if you say anything to differ with it, you're not welcome to be here as a student. You're not welcome to be here as a staff member. Um, if you cite a scholar that, that goes against that perspective, um, you are not welcome to exist in the community. We want to just completely tear you down and make it so that you just don't even exist as a person in the community anymore. And that's the danger. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I could look at that person who just voiced those opinions and say, all right, well, I'm sure there's some common points that we can identify um, and agree upon that, where we could still work together in a civil way. 
Um, from that, from the other side that you just mentioned, the answer is no, there is no common points. You're a despicable person for even saying or, or suggesting uh, that there's another way to view this. And, you know, in sol- out of solidarity, we're going to make sure we eliminate you and you're neutralized uh, out of the space. Um, and that's the difference between the different perspectives. You know, someone coming from a classical perspective like myself, who's able to say, we can agree to disagree, right? And we can still work together and hold hands. We can even march together, um, you know, on some common points. Um, no, there's none of that. Uh, there's there's um, a pushing out. Um, and, and even if we agree, disagree on the slogans and, and on the way that, that the, uh, 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 the points of history itself, um, that becomes a, a reason to, to, to eliminate somebody and to, to neutralize them. There cannot be viewpoint diversity um, or even different ways of understanding the world um, beyond you know, what's being pushed um, as an orthodoxy upon everybody. Did you get any kind of support from the students uh, as your drama was unfolding at uh, De Anza? Yes, I did. I did. I had support from stu- the student government um, as well as, um, you know, some individual faculty members. Uh, but student government was strongly supportive um, when I talked about expanding our understanding of heritage months, uh, recognizing months that we had never recognized on the campus, um, like Jewish American Heritage Month, Arab American Heritage Month. We had never recognized any of those kinds of things because there's a black-white binary and those are the two groups that get focused on um, in, in this worldview. And I was just pointing out the richness of our community and our student government voted, uh, made a resolution to support the work of the Heritage Month work group and several of them joined uh, that campus-wide uh, work group. So there was strong support from students. Um, it was these, these radicalized um, extremist faculty members, you know, who were seated on my tenure review committee um, and who made the, you know, ultimate decisions, um, who, who, you know, attacked me for purely ideological reasons. Um, and they were even against the work of the Heritage Month work group. <laughs> so, you know, no, there, there, no authentic inclusion, because if it's not focused on what they call decentering whiteness, uh, which really turns out, Glenn, to be anti-whiteness, like it's a, against anything that appears to be white or white adjacent or white associated, um, it, it's a very hateful and, and, and limiting way of seeing the world, seeing your peers, uh, seeing your college community. Um, but it, it's not just there, it's, it's on many campuses. Um, and now the rest of the world is starting to see it because we're seeing them spill out into the streets, uh, the, the students and the protesters who are getting extra credit you know, from their uh, professors uh, and being encouraged to go participate in these die-ins and you know, all of these other social actions that we're seeing under this toxic, critical social justice umbrella. Are you seeing that or do you think you would be if you were still at uh, De Anza be seeing that there amongst those students? Yes, we're definitely, I'm, I'm seeing it, you know, when I turn on uh, what, give me a news agency, um, you know, even the, 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 the ones that were um, not focused on issues of speech are currently highlighting, you know, um, some of these happenings on our American campuses and in the streets. I was struck when I took a look at the a Wikipedia page on De Anza at the demography of the student body, which is like half Asian. I mean, and it's a really relatively small proportion of the students are black. Mm-hmm. And yet you have this black white binary going there. I'm, I'm wondering how that works. Is the faculty uh, demographically similar to the student body in that respect? No, no, it's not. Um, if, if you were looking like it, it in terms of, you know, understanding, um, equity and equality is representation. No, um, it, it's not representative. It's not matching the student body, the, the faculty. How does it differ? Uh, there would be more white representation among the faculty there. Aha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And, and the whites are, quote unquote, woke in the, in the main? Um, the majority. And if you're not, uh, you just stay quiet. Uh, because you see the steamroller that will come over you um, if you dare to offend or say something I'm different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, yeah, you definitely wouldn't see that. <laughs> yeah. So what's what's happening? Uh, h- how are you proceeding? Uh, is there, uh, do you have legal recourse? Uh, uh, you say you've decided to go public. Uh, how, mm-hmm. what's, your, what's your plan? So um, thankfully, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism uh, legal advocacy ah. team has been involved in this, um, and they have provided me with representation um, in uh, a case against uh, De Anza College. 
Um, beyond that, though, I've 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 moved um, beyond the just the. Um, it was like my my opponents wanted to silence me then, but they gave me a wider voice. So now I'm a senior fellow for uh, Do No Harm Medicine, helping them understand how um, DEI is is corrupting the medical field. Um, in medical teacher training and so forth. And then also I'm director for the Coalition of Empowered Education. And what we're working on are alternatives uh, to the ethnic studies programs that are now being mandated in K through 12 spaces. In California, it's gonna become a graduation requirement if some people have their ways for uh, students to take ethnic studies classes that really focus on a critical social justice framework uh, so every student will be indoctrinated in that framework in order to make it out of high school if if some advocates have their way. And so we're working uh, hastily and busily on um, getting a, a alternative to that liberated ethnic studies framework that they're pushing. So some are going to say, Tabia, that you've become an anti-DEI person. But in your defense, I would say, no, you're just taking the diversity dimension of DEI quite seriously and insisting on intellectual diversity of perspective on questions that are complicated and, and difficult to deal with. Yes. Um, so, okay. Um, anything else that you would like to add to our discussion about your experience? I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to tell my audience what you want them to hear. Well, I really uh, want people to just get more involved. Um, you know, we've seen things that have been shocking to us on the news recently, um, but it goes much deeper uh, than just the snapshots that we see, you know, and the articles that we're taking a look at. I hope that people will continue to get involved um, at whatever level of education, K through 12, um, higher ed, seeing what's happening in these ethnic studies programs, gender studies program, anything ending with studies should be a red light to you. Um, to, to just kind of pump the brakes and take a double look into what's being taught. Um, because often that's where a lot of these frameworks um, that we're seeing go out into all the other disciplines. Uh, that's where they're rooted in. They're rooted in this critical social justice framework um, that is uh, pushing in, in, a, in a very uh, strong way at this time to be embedded throughout every single discipline and every area of study. Um, and, you know, it's definitely a worldview. It's a way of understanding the world. And I would encourage people when you're seeing the terms, the, um, the curriculum exercises, a focus on race, a focus on gender, a focus on check boxes instead of whole people and whole communities and cultures um, and pluralism, uh, which is what you know America has been founded on. Um, when you see that anti-American stream, uh, even in your American studies classes, uh, start to question it and ask these these faculty members and the school presidents and you know um, and and the board members. You know um, what is going on here and what are we trying to create for our communities? Why are we saying there's only one way to view an issue or a subject area when there's many ways to view it? Um, and and that's what's beautiful about learning and teaching. Um, when we're able to see that. And, and why can't we have ethnic studies that's taught in a pro-American way, in a, in a way that honors the pluralism and the, and the wonderful value of all these different ethnicities and cultures that have contributed to the fabric of America? And that doesn't mean that we're abandoning, um, you know, the, 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 the hard issues that we all need to face and look at. That doesn't mean we're painting them with a rainbow or anything like that. You can look at everything in American history and in um, you know American society, and understand the different contributions that have been made um, through a lens of resilience, through a lens of human dignity and human agency. It doesn't have to be through victims and oppressors, and we're perpetually in these roles, and we have to show solidarity because that's what some you know sociologist is telling us. You know um, who we're uplifting and centering now. It doesn't have to be that way. There's better ways to do this work. And there are scholars who are talking about it. There are people developing curricula around it. Um, and, it and it's time for us to take a look at that and get back to the values uh, that, that we hold dear. Otherwise, we're just going to be torn asunder by these divisive uh, ideologies. Well, if that was a sermon, I'd be saying amen right now. Amen. Uh, but I, 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 you, you mentioned that uh, the... The sickness here that we're identifying, uh, which might have its uh, genesis and critical social justice thought in the studies departments can creep into other areas. And you mentioned the do no harm 
uh, initiative. And we have a few minutes here. Can you tell us a little bit about that uh, what, in, in medicine and, and how you got there? Because your background doesn't seem to naturally lend itself to, to medicine, although you're very strong on the issues of diversity. But anyway, uh, do no harm. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm really thankful to be a senior fellow with them. Um, I was tapped due to my work around um, a, a concept that I coined in the early uh, 2000s, ideology and practice. Um, and this is a, um, an understanding that I've brought to teachers to help them understand that they do enact and embody different ideologies in their daily practice, in their interaction with students, in their interaction with communities. Um, you know, there, there are race and gender and political and religious ideologies embedded in those interactions and, and just getting teachers to be more aware of that. How that connects to Do No Harm is they're attempting, uh, Do No Harm Medicine, is they're attempting to um, expose some of the ideologies that have crept into the uh, training of medical and health professionals. Um, and as they started to examine the curricula, the training, the um, continuing education programs, uh, they saw that there was a, a, um, a, a worldview being advanced upon doctors and medical professionals um, that they should begin to focus on uh, racial justice, uh, health equity, um, you know, all of these other terms that don't have anything to do with treating the patient that's immediately in front of you, but are that are more socially focused. Um, and so I did some research around a particular group called uh, White Coats for Black Lives. Um, and this group has over 100 chapters on our public and private um, colleges and universities for medical professionals, folks who've taken the Hippocratic Oath, you know, uh, to do no harm, to, you know, do restorative care. Um, they're participating in die-ins on behalf of this group. They're laying on the ground pretending to be dead. Um, they are advancing, um, you know, um, come out and protest um, uh, Israel um, stand up for the Hamas freedom fighters, as they call them. Um, and it's your duty to do this as a medical professional. Um, and so these are folks who've taken the Hippocratic Oath, um, who are now, you know, being indoctrinated into an ideological perspective uh, through their student campus groups, um, and sometimes even through the, the trainings that they're getting um, in terms of continuing education practicum. Um, it's focused on racial justice and health justice, um, instead of, you know, how do we provide competent and compassionate care uh, to people? So it's deeply concerning um, to me to see, you know, um, some of our medical professionals and the things that they've posted even recently, you know, around uh, global events that are taking place um, and how would a, a patient who is of um, Jewish descent or, you know, even uh, someone who identifies as a Zionist feel comfortable going into, um, you know, a care with a doctor who's posting things, you know, um, that that they may perceive to be uh, calling for genocide against, uh, you know, Israeli people. Okay, it's, it's my duty to try to conjure <laughs> the other side. And here's how I could imagine it might go. Uh, we're looking at health disparities and differences in mortality and morbidity and susceptibility to disease. And we're looking at access to healthcare disparities and who's covered and who's not covered and what kind of docs do they get and uh, so on. And we're seeing huge disparities there. And we think that's a social justice problem. Sorry, but we do. We think environmental justice would take account of the, where our hazardous facilities are located relative to residential populations and uh, we think that the clinical practice of uh, various specializations may be in infected with a certain kind of implicit bias or stereotypes or something like that that work adversely to the provision of care to our people. And so here we're training professionals, and we think that as uh, custodians of the health of uh, society, of the healthcare needs of society, our uh, trainees, our, our doctors and nurses and uh, so on, uh, ought to not just know their biochemistry and, and, uh, and anatomy, we think they also have to be aware of the structures. Yes, I said structures of uh, racial domination and, dis and inequality and privilege and so on that are, uh, are in a healthy healthcare delivery system at the forefront of the minds of the people who are serving. How can you be against that? And again, the fact that there's a war in the Middle East and that some of our people may be to the left of or whatever direction it is in terms of being pro-Palestinian or, or pro-people of Gaza. You keep saying pro-Hamas. I'm not pro-Hamas. I'm not in favor of terrorists. 
uh, I'm not in favor of the slaughter of innocents. I'm looking at two and a half million people confined, et cetera, et cetera. You know how the speech goes. Mm -hmm. What do you want to say to that, Katie? You know, um, Glenn, when I when I went to Israel, um, we went to, uh, I was part of a Sharaka delegation there um, in May. And we went to a hospital in Galilee. And the administrator of that hospital was an Arab, uh, Arab man. Um, and he guides his hospital workers, uh, Jewish people, Arab people, all types of people on his staff. Uh, he said that even some of the people who had fired rockets directly at the, you know, hospital where they serve, um, they had treated them from the misfires that had taken place. Um, and he mentioned and he said, you know, when my staff comes through the door, they're in service of whoever comes in for us to serve. There are no longer a Jew, an Arab, a this, a that, all these names and labels and check boxes. They are health professionals in service of whoever comes before us and we serve them to the best of our ability using you know, the, the best technologies and medicines that we have. And I was so touched by him explaining the ethos, like how do they work with people and diverse people and even people who just literally just attack them. Um, and having that mind frame and that mindset from a leader is so key because every staff member we talked to, not, not just him, you know, they echoed that. It came from the leadership. And so I think that's something that we're lacking in so many spaces here in, in America. So many people uh, don't have the moral courage to say and do what they know is the right thing to do. Um, you know, to, to say, if I'm at an institution, my students have a right to free speech. They can say what they want to, right? But as an administrator... I can also counter that and say, hey, um, this doesn't reflect the view of the entire learning community. And I can make spaces where other perspectives can be heard or even possible being heard. When we all just sit and we're quiet and we just look at the loudest voices and we just kind of cower to them, that means we are all complicit. And, you know, the, the old saying used to be from the critical social justice advocates, silence is violence, right? It's complicity. Um, it's complicity when you say nothing, when, when, when someone's calling for death and genocide and you say, you know, that's not what all of us stand for here. Um, then you become complicit in, in that and you say that this is what we do here and, and what they're doing is okay when you make no counter statement or, or you don't create a space for even counter statements to be heard. Um, so that's what I would like to see more on our campuses in terms of moral courage and leadership from, you know, um, from presidents, from these bloated administrative bodies, um, you know, where we have 10, 20, you know, chief diversity officers and a diversity this and an equity this person. Uh, I'd like to see more of those people stand up and create authentic spaces for authentic inclusion um, where everyone feels welcome, not just uh, certain groups or, you know, who've been deemed uh, that they should be heard, um, not just certain standpoints, not just certain ways of being and understanding the world and knowledge. Um, it, it should be open to everyone. And we're not seeing that openness right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Tabia Lee, uh, a veteran of the culture wars in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space in American higher education, uh, who's an eloquent eloquent spokeswoman uh, for a point of view that I hope gets a wider hearing as we go forward in the years ahead. I appreciate you giving me your time today, Tate. Thank you. Thank you.